Good afternoon, everyone. My name's uh, Rick Statham. I'm uh, Joint Managing Director of Safety and Access, and I'm here today to talk to you about some uh, recent developments uh, and updates within the scaffolding uh, and access industry. One of the significant changes that we, uh, we've seen this year was the, the review of the guidance note for the safe working at height for scaffolders. Uh, that was reviewed um, last year and uh, came into play at the end of November 2010, and that's SG4. Uh, the title of the document now is Preventing Falls in Scaffolding. The background is, as we're all at the, the, the Access Industry Forum, falls from height unfortunately do account um, for most of the, the fatal accidents that occur in construction. And obviously scaffolders by nature of the, the way that they work are required to, to obviously work at height and provide temporary access for others to use. Um, SG4 is not a new document, it's been around uh, since 2000 and during its lifetime it has been a very positive uh, contributor to the reduction of accidents in the scaffolding industry. As you can see uh, from the figures there, a 78% reduction in the number of falls despite a 20% increase in the number of members of the National Access and Scaffolding Confederation. So the figures there uh, really speak for themselves. This is the kind of thing uh, that we're looking to avoid in the industry. Here you've got some uh, scaffolders doing some adaptions to a scaffold, clearly in an unacceptable situation, an unsafe situation uh, with today's standards. And tragically, even in March of this year, um, a scaffolder fell to his death uh, whilst they were, uh, dismantling a scaffold. He was actually working alongside his 21-year-old son. So a, uh, a tragedy there and uh, absolutely avoidable. Well, we all understand the principles of the work at height regulations, uh, I'm sure. Um, avoid work at height where possible. Well, that's not always... Uh, 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 is very, very rarely an option that a scaffolding contractor has. Uh, provide work equipment to prevent falls. In other words, a physical barrier to prevent falls whilst working at height. And as a uh, last resort in the hierarchy of control to mitigate the consequences of a fall. So that could be um, soft landing systems or safety nets. But the default situation for the scaffolding industry for for many years has been obviously been the use of a safety harness and lanyard. Um, that's one of the elements that uh, the new guidance looks to change and to challenge. The key change within the new uh, industry guidance note for scaffolding is that um, for many years uh, there was an allowance uh, for a scaffolder to walk out on an unprotected edge of a scaffold to put an upright in, a standard, known as a standard, so that they can fix their single guardrail to that for their own protection. And the reason that this was, was in there was because the developing technology at the time, the guidance, the last review of the guidance in 2005, meant that there wasn't really any other options. There was no way to use um, a safety harness because if you were going to attach to the ledges below the working platform for a scaffolder, they would foul on the transoms and it wouldn't be possible for a scaffolder to, uh, to do that, to place a standard whilst protected. That was known as the unprotected traversing or tunneling element, and that has now uh, disappeared. That has been withdrawn from the, uh, from the guidance note. So the challenge now is for scaffold contractors to, to find an alternative way in which to do that. That's the situation we're looking at, and as I say, the difficulty is not having anywhere to attach to whilst walking out on an exposed edge to top out a standard. So what can contractors do? Well, a contractor's now got to create what we call a scaffolder safe zone. So this is a position for a scaffolder to work at height whilst he is providing, uh, obviously, access for others to use. A scaffolder safe zone, there you can see an example, and this is still the case today, a single guardrail uh, on a non-working lift, in other words, on a progressive lift, is still acceptable for a scaffolder today, and uh, HSE have, uh, have conceded and give us a concession within the industry for that on a non-working lift. 
as physical protection, obviously collective fall prevention. Another alternative is to use where it's appropriate powered access uh, on one of the diagrams and uh, one of the photographs there. That's the work at Terminal 5 and that scaffold is working from edge, uh, placing edge protection using um, uh, powered access and then beneath a motorway bridge there you've got some scaffolders working from uh, a scissor lift to fit uh, scaffolding beneath a motorway bridge. There are several um, versions of advanced guardrails, proprietary equipment that has developed over the last few years. That's just a couple of examples of advanced guardrail systems which essentially provide edge protection ahead of the scaffolder as he gets onto his working lift before he puts in the guardrails and the tow boards for everyone else to use. Some quite, uh, well, very uh, popular innovations at the moment is, uh, if you look on the right-hand side, uh, your right as you look at it, is the scaffolder step. That's a, a, simply a step where a scaffolder will stand on, place an upright above him, which creates ed pr edge protection for the next lift as the, as the scaffolder goes onto the next lift. That's an extremely popular um, solution at the moment to provide collective fall prevention and then on the left hand side you've got some proprietary fittings that the scaffolder can slide up into place so there's a there's edge protection on the lift above as they uh, as they go up to put on the next scaffold lift and as we said before from a progressive way of working that is uh, acceptable as a scaffolder's safe zone today the use of safety harnesses, whilst the work at height regulations do state that it should be a last resort, the use of safety harnesses are definitely here to stay. There will always be situations where a scaffolder does have to rely upon the use of personal uh, fall arrest. For example, if we're going to put a temporary roof in or we're going to, put, we're going to need to use some beams, um, then uh, a safety harness will be the only way forward if it isn't possible to use powered access from below. And then you can see on the left-hand side at the bottom, that's a scaffolder on a hanging scaffold using an inertia reel. Whereas again, if you can't get powered access in from below, uh, such as if it's a congested area or work over water, for example, then that again would be the default situation in scaffolding. Even in a convention, conventional scaffolding situation, if you, you, know, you, you provide um, five lifts of scaffold and you only want the top lift boarded, as the scaffolder takes his boards up, he will create um, an unprotected area, as you can see there. But the difference in that situation is that for that relatively short period of time, the scaffolder can actually attach to the ledger above him, which is fixed on load-bearing fittings. The HSE, uh, and particularly Philip White, head of construction, has endorsed the new guidance note that came out in uh, uh, November of last year uh, and the important point to mention there is that the HSE no longer accept the unprotected traversing uh, and therefore that means, as I said earlier, scaffold contractors definitely have a challenge on how they can manage that risk. Another development in the industry was uh, a technical guidance note known as TG20. That's been around for a couple of years now but essentially um, the technical standards for scaffolding uh, changed a, a while back and resulted in the withdrawal of the old British standard. This is based upon European uh, standards, but this is the UK version for tube and fitting, if you like, the bridging document. Essentially, um, the fundamentals in terms of the day-to-day -day work of a scaffolder haven't changed much at all. The challenge now is the justification of a scaffold that is going to be erected. So a basic scaffold, in other words, an independent scaffold founded from the ground, if that meets a certain criteria, that doesn't require any additional design input. But certainly special type scaffolds, such as a, uh, a slung scaffold or a hanging scaffold or a cantilever scaffold, for example, that will require some kind of design input. So what is a basic scaffold? Well, a basic scaffold that can be erected without design input has uh, basic load classes ranging from very light duty to heavy duty. Only one working lift at full load and one at 50% load. So if you're in the, uh, you know, if you uh, engage scaffold contractors and you want a scaffold that requires three or four working lifts to be used at any one time, 
then that will require some kind of design input and justification. Um, nominal lift heights of 2 metres or 2.7 metres if you need to leave access at the base for pedestrian access. That's a, a basic scaffold. Basic tie patterns for lines of ties on every lift or on alternate lifts. At least 50% of the ties are to be fitted to uh, ledger brace frames. And where a pavement lift is required, in other words, if you want to erect a scaffold at 2.7 metres so people can walk underneath that, ties have to be in at that first lift level. There is a, a quite a, a useful toolbox talk available from the NASC uh, on the use of uh, TG20 and if you have a responsibility for managing or monitoring scaffolding operations, I would certainly recommend that you uh, do some further reading on that. There is also a very, uh, a very good interactive guide that's available from the NASC that will uh, assist you in whether you're the scaffolds that you require on your site are basic scaffolds or whether they actually require any design input. Um, you have the ability to um, put your own little sort of scaffold specification in there. And if you can see up along the, along the, uh, the toolbar there, there is a TG20 check that has a red cross in there. That is essentially because if you look at the base of the scaffold, there is a standard missing with some beam working and that therefore requires design input. So that makes the classification of that scaffold non-standard. That will require some design input because we want to leave out an upright at the base of the scaffold there. As you can see, I don't know if that will come up on here. There. Okay. And that's the TG20 check that actually says that the bridge of the structure there, sorry, the bridge of the structure there doesn't comply with TG20 as a basic scaffold um, in the Red Cross area because of that bridging section that requires some design input. Very recent um, development within the industry, the NESC are offering to industry uh, a specification. It's basically a Word document that people can adapt for their own use um, as a main contractor, scaffold contractor on an occupier. Um, you can adapt that, but basically the document covers uh, industry best guidance around regulations, competence, scaffolder safety, PPE, and technical requirements. And um, generally, people can take that document, put their own branding on there, uh, adapt it to suit your operations, and use that as your own scaffolding specification uh, for the management of scaffolding on your site. And obviously, maybe to pass on to scaffold contractors um, as uh, your scaffold specification for works undertaken on your site. That essentially is an update of the, the main changes within the, uh, the access and scaffolding industry. I'd uh, gladly take any questions if there are any.